today uh, with my friend, uh, Sean. Very good to have you. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about politics. And, uh, you know, I know you live in this space more than I do. Maybe talk a little bit about the worship events you've been doing and what you're seeing, because you've got a really unique perspective, even as a Christian on the road hosting these events. And uh, we've got one coming up in Arizona as well. So maybe explain a little bit about what you've been doing there. Yeah. So, uh, well, to go back before COVID, I actually ran for U.S. Congress. And we can get into that conversation later if you want. Um, I didn't want to do it. I really felt the Lord was calling me to do it. And I did it in California, which... <laughs> just, yeah, just, bro, that's... Man, I don't... That's like... Rec- yeah, uh, California has got to... I mean, you, you, you've got to feel like it's an ex-wife. You know, it's, it's just <laughs> impossible to make it warm and friendly. <laughs> well... Well, especially when I was running in a very, pretty much a blue, a Bay Area district. So, but anyway, long story short, God actually called me to do that. It was very clear. It was, it really was the word of the Lord. It was bizarre at the time. And, you know, I had a good life before that. <laughs> and, but it opened my eyes it, as I peeked behind the veil of the, the political world and how dark it is and how evil it is and how, how, demonic it is and exposed uh the agendas that were at work that i didn't know about i was kind of naive and so anyway fast forward covid happened things locked down strip clubs were open bars were allowed to be open the church was mandated to be shut i was in california the most locked down state in america the most commie state in america and i knew because of my insight of running for congress i knew it was actually happening i knew the agenda that was at play it was like god had me had me get, gave me the insight to see the playbook of the enemy for the next season. So anyway, long story short, we launched Let Us Worship at the height of the pandemic. I became the number one COVID violator in 29 states, including yours. Congratulations. Because yes. Rona got, got fined, I, I think it was $25,000 for worshiping in Arizona. Uh, and uh, did, you, did you pay the fine? It was one of the bigger fines, actually. I think we paid a part, a partial amount, or maybe a donor paid a partial amount. I don't know. It was a pretty intense legal process. We had allies to uh, I, uh, ADF advocating for us. We had a lot of people fighting. Um, anyway, but the point is, is that that movement that was birthed ignited something in a really dark time. Well, last the beginning of last year, I felt like the Lord spoke to me with the overturning of Roe, that the fight for life, the fight for religious liberty, the fight for all these things was going to, was going to each state capital. So we are now on the tail end of a 50-state U.S. capital tour, bringing worship, prayer, communion, revival, um, you know, advo- advocating all these things to all the state capitals. And we've done about 46 capitals. We have four left to go. Those four capitals happen to be the most consequential leading up to these elections with Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Georgia, and then finishing in Arizona. So uh, it's been a wild journey. I could go on and on and on to the things I've experienced and seen, but um, man, it, it's been a wild ride. And I feel like, I actually feel really encouraged with with what what I see God doing as we go capital to capital. It's awesome. Um, so got the book out, uh, Bo Like Jesus. I'm a Bible teacher. I, d- I don't start in the political space, but I'm trying to, you know, do my part. What would you say to those evangelical leaders? And there are some, thank you, my friend. There are some that are influential that are saying almost the Anabaptist position that Christians should not vote, that because we don't have a godly candidate, um, that, you know, we should abstain from the political process and the election cycle. What would your answer be to that growing chorus of evangelical leaders? Yeah. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm super excited. You wrote this. What a gift. Uh, so amazing. So timely. Thank you for all the work you did to to put that out. So definitely read the book, but then also like read this book. And I think the more that you read about the great commission, you know, cause I'm a missionary. Like people may even think, oh, Sean's political. I'm actually not. I'm a, I'm a missionary. Like my parents were full-time missionaries. I grew up in a missions home. I've been to seven of the top most 
seven of the top 10 most persecuted unreached nations in the world. I approached the political space when God told me to run as any other mission field. Like it was not difficult to me. It was like, hey, this is a dark area that needs the light and the salt. We should probably bring it there. And that was my approach. Now, I had no idea that it was so complicated or complex to so many people when to me it really seemed simple. You know, when Jesus said, bring the gospel to the ends of the earth, to Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth, every sphere of society, every part of culture, that's what he means, leave no stone unturned. And so, you know, if, if we don't have the gospel witness present in the political space, then we are abdicating our authority as believers to have a voice, to shine the light, to be salt in a, in a, in a place that really needs it. And to, to be honest with you, Mark, we're in the position that we are with the candidates that we are in America because we have not engaged for so many years. And so uh, we got to get this thing back on track, man. And in order to do that, we got to engage. Well, and within that, there's a large percentage of Christians that simply do not vote. Oh, it, you're talking. We talk about California. I did the 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 the, the data, the statistics uh, during my race. If every believer in the state of California just simply voted, we would flip this entire state overnight. Everything would be changed overnight because typically you'll have fifty uh, percent of eligible Christians don't vote in a every four year. Uh, or, or not registered to vote in an every four-year election, and then half of those half don't even vote. So we're just, it, it, it's, we are literally a part of society that out of pietism or I don't even know what it is, re religion, whatever is withholding us, our voices are not heard. Our voices are not recognized. Our values are not propagated. And so that's a big part of my heart, even why we're going to Capital Capital. Like, let's just do the basic like American thing here. Let's exercise our right that so many have fought so hard for in order to have our voice be heard. And I think if we start there, just in that simple place, we would see a world of difference in this nation. But what about those uh, who would say, you know, we don't have a godly candidate. It's not like, you know, Kamala Harris or Donald Trump, yeah. you know, seems to have repented of their sin, trusted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior be filled with the Holy Spirit and come under the authority of his word. God can judge souls. He determines, you know, who's kindling and who's family. But at the end of the day, we, we don't have like, we don't have either candidate probably wouldn't make it to be on staff at a church. Yeah. You know, just by, by virtue of life choices. But what would you say to those who would, who would articulate that until we get a godly candidate, we can't support anybody? Then you're going to be waiting for all of eternity. <laughs> Jesus is not on the ballot. Uh, until that happens, I mean, we'd all be excited. He's not on the ballot. He's not running in this election. And we're left with uh, fractured, broken, sinful human beings. And, you know, but thank God that he has a history of using people just like that. Yeah. And, you know, I don't know that you would probably find Samson working at a church or David working at a church or any of these guys being a pastor. Uh, super flawed, crazy men uh, that God decided to use. And, you know, it's not our job. I think there is a lot of self-righteousness when we begin to judge the character flaws of all these people and all these candidates. I think really we just got to pray, hey, Lord, what what is your heart? What is your will? Like, we cannot be a fatalistic in our approach that God doesn't want to intervene in the affairs of men. No, that's opposite of what we see historically. Yeah. God uses a lot of broken people to do amazing things. And our heart is like, okay, who is the person, God, that your hands on? Who would who who's the person that's gonna stand for X, Y, and Z? And we need to be on that because I think God does have a heart behind this. He is moving. And we need to find out what that is and then come into alignment with with his heart. Yeah, and I would say there's you know, there's policies and there's personalities and at the end of the day, your, your vote needs to really be primarily driven by policy because whether or not you like someone, their personality will be gone in four to eight years, but their policies will remain and abide. Like yeah. here we are in a border state in Arizona, and depending upon who you believe, 10 to 20 million people have entered the country illegally. Well, 
you know, they're going to need housing. Some of them are going to be committing crimes. They're going to need medical care for the rest of their life. And so those policies are going to continue long after the personalities that made those policies. And so my question to you would be, as you're talking to um, those who are faith-based, church-going, Christian, what would be the issues insofar as policies go that you would say, these are the weightier matters? There are some less weighty matters that, that maybe we can concede on, but these would be the primary issues that if you're a believer, they have to drive your vote and your decision making. Yeah. Well, I, I look, you know, I look primarily with what what is the role of government, you know, what what is the role of 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 our government is to protect. Um, it's to it's to create safety. Um, it's to you, you mean like you can't you can't protect, you can't create safety if you don't have borders. And I think that, you know, what you mentioned is a huge thing. I go city to city to city and I am faced daily with the reality of the the uh, opioid epidemic, the overdose epidemic, the amount of drugs. I mean, it's absolutely insane. The human trafficking, uh, the that, that's caused a lot by the border, uh, the perversion. 300,000 missing children. It's insane. I mean, Mark, I could list... 25 issues right now i mean there's to me it's not the the fact that we're even having to like present a case it should be clearly obvious to every believer out there you know i mean this is not a like this is not a hard election this is not a, a difficult complex thing there's no nuance here right one yeah. side wants to cut off body parts of children one side wants to kill babies up until the ninth month of uh, of 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 you know of them being in the room. One side wants a complete hijacking of the economy with government controlled food prices, which always leads to socialism and destruction. Completely. One side wants millions and millions of of illegals to vote and to sway that. I mean, it's it, this is not difficult. The fact that pastors and leaders have to even have these conversations shows how deceived the American church is. There's no nuance. There's no difficulty here. It's very easy. And, you know, part of what frustrates me is that we talk about this on a podcast and we throw things up there on Twitter, but people have not seen what I've seen. I've been to 46 capitals. Every single one of those cities is a blue bastion of liberalism and godlessness and perversion. Every single capital in our nation is a hard blue dot of gospel resistance. The government has failed us. And, you know, we have to, We, I mean, this is a very, I feel a lot of urgency, to be really honest. I'm a very hopeful person. I'm super optimistic. But I also feel a lot of urgency. Like, these next couple months are going to determine a lot for the future of our nation, for the future of our children. And so, you know, we got to just throw out this idea that there's even a discussion about this. I mean, it is absolutely clear and obvious to anybody that reads this book, believes the word of God, what we should do in the days to come. So do you think that uh, there's any argument to be made for a Bible-believing Christian to support the uh, harris Waltz campaign? Is that even a, is that even a possibility? Uh, 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 absolutely not. There's not even an inkling of even the, the failed arguments that they, I, I call them the heretics for Harris. They call themselves the evangelicals for Harris, whatever. I yeah, like and none of them are evangelicals, by the way. <laughs> Do what? None of them are evangelicals. No. 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 Well, the vote for Jesus sign got banned in my hometown of the city of Scottsdale. So we have decided to increase our ministry by making more signs. If the government doesn't like a sign, then you need to get that sign. We'd love to send one to you. If you purchase uh, the Boat Like Jesus book, we'll send you a sign. And if you live in an HOA, you can have the ministry of annoying that board. You can find the book and the sign at realfaith.com slash vote. It's all there. But I mean, you know, you look at, at Wallace, I mean, it's like, it's like if it wasn't clearly obvious enough with Kamala and her history of the craziness she's done, then you take a guy like him. That is a guy that passed a bill in Minnesota, signed a bill that authorizes the government to take 
children, to take, rip children away from their parents, which refused to cut off their body parts under the guise of gender affirming care. He advocated, he signed a bill authorizing the government to remove children from families so the government can, can inject them and cut off parts of their body. I mean, this is an evil, evil man, like evil. Like we just got to call it what it is. And I don't care. I'll take the hate and the whatever. Like I'm just going to, I'd rather be on God's side. I'm going to call a spade a spade. That is an evil man. And, you know, when they partnered up together, I was like, oh, here we go. I mean, that is the most progressive ticket ever yeah. by a lot. By a landslide. I mean, I mean, this this makes me miss Obama. And I never thought I would miss Obama. The Clintons used to talk about abortion being safe, rare, and legal. Yeah. I mean, the Democratic Party today has slid so far to the left that right. it's it's inconceivable. I, and I don't think the average person really understands just when you when you do have Harrison Waltz, you are taking a gigantic leap to the left on every economic and social issue all at once. Irrecoverable. Yeah, and I really like I, I, I love some of the things you've been sharing and I and, and I want to echo a little bit of that as there is some serious demonic sorcery witchcraft thing going on here that would even remotely make this race tight because i mean for three and a half years these guys have destroyed america on every level and all the polling proves that you know in the and the economy on 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 health care on uh, the border on all these things right and so now you have a person that's can actually convincing a lot of americans that she is going to do something she hasn't done in the last three and a half years. She she's the change the candidate. She's yes. the change candidate. She can fix the, the problems that she created. Like that's the most mind boggling thing to me. I mean, you got to be under some serious, like wicked spell to buy into that. And, you know, really a lot of it comes down to it. it it's, it, I don't even know if it's as much that or a hatred more like this irrational hatred more Trump, but either way, we're in a situation right now where, I mean, that the, the race is so tight, the polling is so tight, uh, everything is so locked in. And to me, I am bewildered by it. I really am. I mean, I am bewildered by it. There's, there's not a, 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 there's not even clarity around her platform, their platform, Harrison Walls. They can't even distinguish or share what they're going to do. They have no plans. Yeah. And, the fact that this is even close is mind-boggling. The fact that we have had two assassination attempts against a, a, a former president is so mind-boggling. The fact that there's five actual teams, assassin teams that Congress has recognized that are right now in the U.S. trying to take out President Trump. I mean, how are people not awake? It's shocking to me. And so, I mean... Good for you on, on, on rallying people to, to, to open up, you know, and, and I'm hoping that, that there'll be some kind of supernatural awareness that's going to come in the next 40 days. So that, well, we yeah. And on that, on the, so I think part of it is two things. I think number one, most elections are decided by women, particularly suburban women. Yeah. The men are going to vote Republican. The blue dots are going to always vote Democrat. It really comes down to the women. And I think part of it is, I think uh, for a lot of women, it's like, I'm going to vote for a woman because they've been so um, indoctrinated in feminism that whether or not she can do the job is not the issue. It's just, we're women, we want a woman. And I think with the transgenderism, I think the result is that just good old fashioned feminism seems pretty reasonable in comparison. Yeah. I can you know, and so I think what's driving the uh, the surge, I would call it the Kamala gasm, which is driven by the media, um, is uh, is a lot of just classic feminism that says, you know, we're just voting for her for because she's a woman, regardless of policy or fitness or ability. But part of that you do see in the scriptures, and I'm a Bible teacher. I preach through books of the Bible for thirty years. But part of that is spiritual, where you do see demonic forces at work in politics. You see it with Pharaoh in Egypt. 
You yeah. see it with Herod as well in the days of the New Testament, the killing of John the Baptizer. Herod and uh, Pharaoh are both pro-death politicians trying to kill the boys. You see this uh, in the days of Nebuchadnezzar and the life of Daniel, and you especially see this in the days of Je of, um, of Ahab, Jezebel, and Elijah. Yeah. And what you see there is, you know, Ahab is the the king, but he's this he's this passive, weak, soft, yeah. incompetent. He's very Biden esque. Um, Jezebel is very very uh, powerful. Um, she is really the the power behind the throne and she comes with significant demonic authority yeah and what you see in uh jezebel for those who don't know the story jezebel had a daughter named athalia athalia is the one and only queen in the history of the nation of israel so they always had a king one woman became queen of israel for a few years and it was Athalia through a coup attempt. She didn't um, just remove sitting authority. She destroyed and killed men who had a right to the throne. So if you read the storyline of the Bible, the only woman that ever held the senior political office in the nation of Israel was Jezebel's daughter, Athalia. 100% demonic activity, a clairvoyant spirit at work behind the scenes to enable and allow that to come to pass. And so... I don't know, you know, I don't have a, I don't have a, a peer into the unseen realm, but it seems to me like Kamala Harris is very Athalian and working with that same sort of spirit. And it's, and, and, and the thing that's interesting too is it is, um, it is anti-God. And, and what's wild about for me with Harris and Waltz is Harris, she is part of the American Baptist Church. Yeah. A completely apostate, completely woke, completely pro-abortion, completely um, anti-God denomination that's an abomination, and so is Waltz. He is part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, which is a completely woke, completely apostate, completely anti-Christ abomination de denomination. And so even if you are a believer, you've got to look at this and say, these are people who profess to be Christians. They go to churches that are synagogues of Satan, to quote the New Testament, and they are very, very powerful. And 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 is there not a demonic spirit that is trying to get someone who is anti-Christ, but a member of a church and denomination into a political office? I mean, I, I have to think that in addition to the political, there are genuinely spiritual, theological, biblical things that are at stake and and ultimately at the forefront. And and so if they win, you're going to have you're going to have literally two people who are anti-Christ but claim to be Christians and members of a church pulling the levers for the United States of America for 4 years. Yeah. And and you know for a fact, I know as well. Man, if I'm Satan and demons, I'm like give me the guy or gal who claims Christ but is anti-Christ, how can I help them be more efficient at their undermining mission? Yeah. It's, it's nefarious. It, it, I mean, to think that they're even professing Christ, I mean, it's, it's horrifying. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I think that, you know, it's hard to, it's hard to say if this, if this election isn't an indictment uh, against the intellect of Americans, the reasoning of Americans, the discernment. Of Americans, I mean, at least with Trump, you you, you know what you're going to get. You know, it's like <laughs> I've been with him several times. A lot of people have. He is who he is. And what, what's you know, he like personally? By the way, is he is he different than the uh, the public persona, or is he that's just who no, he is? No, <laughs> not at all. He is he is just a lar larger than life personality that yeah. is actually very personable uh, in person. He's very. You know, we, we we've had a lot of conversations, a lot of conversations about God, and you know, and and it, it, you know, he's very um, when you when you're the person in the room with him, he makes you feel like a million bucks, you know. He, and but he's also a, a New York businessman. He's wheeling and dealing. He's he's seeing the bigger picture of things. You know, he's 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 intense. You know, that's just that's you don't become a real estate mogul and be soft. You know, so. There's that that per, that brash personality which works really well with world leaders and you know <laughs> the uh, 
the I have a I have bigger rockets than you, little rocket man kind of thing. You know, yeah. that, that's that's real. I mean, that is that is actually him. You know, and and that. But what I'm saying, Mark, is at least. At least people know what they're going to get with Harrison Walsh. It's like they won't do interviews, they won't share their policies. There's there's a really dark underbelly of like what's really happening here. Nobody knows, and no one's asking those questions. It's like it's all DEI. It's all, and you're right. Women are largely. My wife and I talk about this all the time. They are so attacked and manipulated by the enemy right now. It's mind boggling. Um, they're so. Uh, it's like the 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 the, what the enemy knows to tear a society down if he can get the moms if he can infiltrate the family and and that's what we're seeing right now and so you know I, I i would say this the silver lining in my opinion as i look at polling and you know because of my political background and i'm close to a lot of senators i'm close to a lot of uh, congressional candidates i'm close to a lot of pollsters and i know probably more data than maybe the average person um I, I really believe that there's no middle ground in this election. There's not undecided yeah. voters. They don't exist. Um, everybody has dug their heels in. They, knew, they know who they're voting for. The debates don't mean anything. They don't change anything. Um, really what it comes down to is what side is going to show up on election day. So it's voter are turnout. Show up? This is really what it comes down to. Are the, are the conservatives, are the Christians, are, the, are they going to show up? Are they going to put their money where their mouth is and get off social media and actually go and vote? Is the church going to go and vote or are they just going to have a prayer meeting? And I love prayer meetings. I believe in prayer meetings. I believe in worship services. But I also believe in people doing their civic duty and and using their vote, even seeing their vote as a as a as a as an extension of their prayers. Um, so that that's really what I believe is going to happen. Whichever side shows up the most is going to win. And uh, I'll, I'll close with this. I'll just ask you one question. So why do you think that there are so, so within evangelicalism, you've got the woke progressive apostates on the far left, and they're talking about social issues and politics and flying rainbow flags, and, and they never get accused of being Christian nationalists, you know, because they're, they're on the other team. On the other side, you've got like the wild mega Trump prophet, you know, like, <laughs> I love those guys, but I feel like a drug test might be merited, you know, like it's like, what, what is going on? Um, and then in the middle, you've got just the average evangelical. Why is it that so many pastors, Christian leaders, churches and pulpits, they're just avoiding any sort of teaching or leading when it comes to politics? Why, are, why, is, why is the same center of believers? Why is it, why is it quiet and why is so little being said? Why, why do you think that is? Well, I think that there's a lot of there's a lot of ungodly beliefs. I mean, we could go into the theology of what's what's handicapping and keep these guys silent. I think that the Johnson Amendment, uh, even though it's a sham and it's a fake, and they don't enforce it, nobody's ever tested it. Well, the Johnson Amendment too. Just so you guys know, like it says that uh, a church, you know, can't endorse a candidate, um, but as a private citizen. Um, a pastor can, yeah. and it's never been tried or tested in court. And, you know, so I'll just tell you, like, I, I'm a Christian conservative Republican in that order. Right. And so I'll be voting for the Republican nominee. I mean, there you go. And what's going to happen to me now is nothing because the Johnson Amendment, um, you know, it, it's never been it's never been applied and it's and never I, been tested. And, and Obama ran both of his presidential campaigns out of a church. And well, so this is the, so this is the thing too. Like, so historically, like you can go to a church and you can have politicians even take the pulpit as long as it's the black church. So whether you've got Al Sharpton or you've got Jesse Jackson or Martin Luther King Jr., you can bring in candidates and speak, and nobody has any problems. I mean, Stacey Abrams, Warnock. Same yeah, thing. Warnock. I mean, they're they're in the pulpit. Her dad's a pastor. I mean, she's nuttier than a Snickers bar. But at the end of the day, you know, she's given the pulpit, and so it's like if you're black or liberal, that's not a problem. If you're if you're conservative, that that is a problem. And right. so, if anything, it would be the political left that would be violating the Johnson Amendment, not the political right. Not not that I even care about the Johnson Amendment. 
Yeah, and and I think we have to realize I, why I'm bringing up the Johnson Amendment is because it was it 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 accomplished its role in giving weak leaders, weak pastors, a, an excuse to feel like they can't say something. And I tested this out, right? Because I'm a worship leader, have a little bit of a platform. You know, I lived in California and I went around to churches, you know, because I told them, they're like, how are you going to win this congressional race when I was running? I was like, oh, we're going to get the churches to vote. This is what I told them at the NRCC in, uh, in DC. They said, how are you going to flip this district? I said, oh, easy. I'm, I'm friends with all the mega church pastors and all the people. We're just going to get the church to vote. And they looked at me and they said, no, 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 that, that's that's not a strategy. Like, really, how are you going to win this? And I'm like, I'm going to get the church to vote. And they looked at me and said, we, we, <laughs> no, we've been trying to do that for 50 years. It doesn't work. Okay. You, we need a real strategy. And I was shocked as I literally went to these church. A lot of these churches, I had like, I knew the pastors. I knew the teams. They knew my character. They knew my integrity. They knew what, you know, I stood for. I had a history there. And, and they would let me come as long as I wouldn't say anything about my race in their district to flip the ungodly, horrible policies. I mean, this is where it really began to like something went off in my eyes. Like, what is happening? Like, and, you know, we tested this. We went out. We mixed worship, you know, events. Like, we want to worship and pray. But, yes, we also want to stand. So get registered to vote. And show up at the poll. We did all this kind of stuff. We crossed things together. I'm a big fan of not keeping the political space over here that you kind of dive into. Let's pull that in, man. Let's make it a part of our life. Let's integrate what God has called us to do. I'm a Christian when I go to the polls. I'm a Christian when I go to church. And we need to start blending these areas together because we believe all this crap of the Johnson Amendment, the separation of church and state, which was meant to protect the church from the state, not the other way yeah. around. Well, and in that too, so that was a letter from Thomas Jefferson, who was a deist, to the Danbury Baptist Association saying that there should be a wall of separation between church and state. It's in no founding documents. It is not law or policy. It is a deist opinion in a letter to the Danbury Baptist Association in the early 1800s. That's it. Exactly. And the U.S. Capitol, I know this because we do prayer meetings in there all the time. We have a ministry center on Capitol Hill. And the Capitol itself was a church building before it ever housed Congress. Its first role, the Capitol building in the U.S. research and fact checkers out there, actually housed a church before it ever housed Congress. So, I mean, there are so many places in our nation, and this is why we have such a long history of God moving and blessing us, and of course the protection of Israel, and there's all kinds of things that we've got right in our history. But we are in a place right now where we have the most ungodly, leftist, Marxist, baby-killing, loving, perverted candidates that could, as you say, in 40 days' time, take over the helm of our government. And so this is an urgent thing, and I, I just pray that even out of this conversation of us going back and forth, if anything, we would get a hundred people registered to vote from just this podcast that would actually go and vote your values, read the Bible and do the right thing. Cool. I look forward to seeing you. Is your family going to be with you when you come to Arizona? Maybe. I, I, it's hard for me to go to Arizona without bringing them. <laughs> well, if you bring them, uh, I promise we'd love to see you and we love your family and appreciate your friendship. Would you be willing to just close our time in prayer? It says to pray for politics and politicians so of course yeah lord we just thank you god for this amazing opportunity god that you have set us up as church to rise and and with courage and boldness and truth god even as people are waffling and and searching and seeking and trying to find lord you have raised us up for such a time as this god with the answers with the hope with the joy with the truth and I pray, God, for every believer out there, God, that this conversation would stiffen the spines of people around the world, God, that they would take great courage and hope. And even, Lord, that this that this conversation would unlock things in some people's minds finally where they're like, oh, I get it now. Now I can step into my calling. Lord, we thank you and we thank you, God, that you are on the throne. We thank you that the government is on your shoulders and we trust you, Jesus, in the days to come. Amen. Amen.